This is this is this is. Oh, good. You look great. How you doing? Oh, doing all right. You know, just kind of sitting around the house on a Friday. Like I've been sitting around the house pretty much every day for about a year and a half now. <laughs> How does that feel? Uh, you know, I don't miss the social interaction too much. And it's kind of, as a guy who's been traveling most of his life, it's kind of interesting to be home for a length of time, you know? Yeah. Do you start noticing the houses around you a little bit more? Yeah, and just, you know, basically, it's nice to kind of take care of things on the home front, because the way my schedule generally works, I leave about every week or two weeks, and then I'm gone for three days, and I come back and have a few days to get stuff together before I leave the next time. So I actually have more patience for, like, you know, stuff like oh, painting the bathroom or whatever it is that you're doing dumb domestically. It's I haven't minded it too much. I, I haven't been playing as much as I would have liked but there was enough stuff going on that I didn't have to. But Bill and I are going back in the studio in a week or so, so we're going to get back to it. Excellent. That's great news. That's that's got to. Yeah. I think you know, just having something to look forward to is great. You 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 mentioned when we were messaging back and forth about maybe wanting to talk about mental health. And, yes, uh, I did. What, what? Why did you want to talk about it? Let's just get into it because well, ha- having okay. something to look forward to is is great for that. I think. But yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, for me, I, I guess it, it was just, a, uh, I was thinking about, in our musical scene, pretty many people are just mentally ill. It's kind of what draws them to the music. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Clarify that. I think <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of us are, but a lot, I think a lot of it becomes destructive. And in some cases, you see the obvious form of it, which is like the, the various drug overdoses and people who die of that. But then there's very, you know, there's a, a very much... Being on tour is hard enough, and if you're a person who has anxiety issues, for example, I mean, pretty many musicians have quit simply because of that. Um, If you're on tour and you're, say, bipolar, well, that's going to be tricky. It's probably going to make for some great shows occasionally, though. I mean, and in my case, I guess I've come to terms with the fact that I am what they call manic depressive, and sadly, when I bottom out, it's very bad, and I get very depressive. And I've, I, I've kind of struggled with it basically my whole life. But when you're young and traveling around and doing gigs, you don't have time to think about that stuff that much, you know, yeah. nor the resources to address it. So I, I feel like in a lot of ways, it kind of has crippled me. What are some of the it, symptoms that ha- like that you started? Well, when I'm up, when I'm up, I'm overly enthusiastic to the point where I can annoy the hell out of people. But when I'm down, I'm incredibly dark and bleak and sometimes very mean. And I started having violence and anger issues at a certain point. And that's kind of what made me realize things weren't maybe good with yeah. me. And I think, you know, a lifetime of being able to cover it up by just, you know, chasing the next gig kind of made it very easy to avoid for very, very many years, you know? Yeah. Busyness, in, yeah, keeps us and, away from it. And I took, uh, back in, I think, 2003, there were a bunch of years in there where all our descendants didn't tour, and I was fresh off a of divorce. And that's about as low as I think I could could get, really, with that stuff. I was a very, very dark person, you know, and uh, I've managed to climb out of it, though. The past year has been interesting, because even before the coronavirus thing, we had a series of forest fires out here. And then when the coronavirus thing hit, we had more of them. And I remember a day when it was like pitch black at noon from the smoke from the forest fires. And we couldn't really go anywhere to get out of it. Yeah. And I remember having like a little wobbly moment where I, you know, it was like, well, what the hell is the point of continuing? Oh, you know, really? And did that scare you? Life, this is what my life has become. Yeah. It, you know, choking on smoke in, in darkness at noon and being afraid to go anywhere because there's a pandemic going on. God. It's like, it's like all the apocalyptic uh, stuff rolled into one. But, you know, I bounced out of that one okay, and I'm very grateful for my wife. She's here and helps me out. Um, this is going to sound really dumb, but one of the things that helped me struggle upwards from that period I was speaking about in 2003 was actually having a dog. Okay. You know, having another animal to take care of helped a lot for whatever it's worth. Yeah, no, I think that that actually makes a difference if you, especially people that are out there alone, you know, if you don't have a partner of some kind, yeah. uh, a oh, pet, yeah. a pet is, is huge. Um, you know, uh, what else, what else besides, you know, having a dog, 
you think helped you? Your your wife, you said. Well, she helps a lot. I read a lot, and you know, some of what I was reading, I read a lot of Buddhist thought, and that kind of helped, and even meditation to a degree. I was very disinclined to seek a psychiatrist, both for the, the financial aspect of it, and the few times I've tried to engage that community over the years, the impulse seemed to be um, medicate first, ask questions later. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really agree with that. I felt like that was kind of like, oh, well, you're going to give me a maintenance dose of something and then we'll basically address my problems not at all and hope that the drugs make the bad feelings go away. Right. So, That's... Also, there's, also, there's also the concern of like this. If, and this is true of like, I think a lot of artists and musicians and bass players is uh, that if I fix my demons, you know, so to speak, will I have, where will my creativity come from? Yeah. And what will that, what will happen to that? That's a big fear. Right. And I've seen friends of mine manage to transcend a lot of that stuff. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the singer songwriter, Austin Lucas. I know Austin. Yeah. He is very publicly addressed his mental health issues and what he's doing to take care of it. And it does involve a certain degree of the medication thing. And I don't think it's really hurt him. I don't think it's hurt his output one bit. No. So yeah. That's a good example, I guess. That is a great example. I mean, a lot of a lot of times as humans, you know, you use crutches to get through like, okay, I got to have a shot before the gig or everybody has something, you know, beer or sometimes it's like heroin, you know? <laughs> yeah, they have rituals. Yeah, rituals to get you through. And, and I have those rituals as well. Uh, but some of them, like you're saying, are super destructive. And, yeah. you know, it, and we got to figure out healthy ways to have rituals. I think rituals are, are great for artists. Um, like when I, when I'm songwriting, I'm in a headspace. And when I'm, when I'm about to go on stage, it's a different headspace than songwriting. Right. Right. But, obviously. So rituals are in, interesting. Uh, but that's, it's, it is definitely, I feel like it's an offset mechanism for a lot of people. And I've known a lot of people who quit serious drug or alcohol habits who use exercise as their thing yeah and it seems to work beautifully you know so that's one good one i did a lot i mean i'm not exactly going to the gym or anything but i i mentioned the dog right well Mm -hmm. uh we about nine years ago we got a dog that's 90 pounds it needs to be walked about a mile a day so that's probably part of the getting your brain a little bit better you know there's something about taking walks that resets whatever is going on and you can oh, yeah. see things from a different perspective. Your heart rate gets up. All, all of that is great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that, dog walking, anything getting outside is, is uh, helpful. Do that. And I'm not a sports guy, you know, so it's not like, I imagine if you are, yeah. though, joining up like uh, with a league of some sort might be cool for some people. I don't know. I just thought to bring up the, uh, it's been on my mind a little, like, you know, if I've gone through this my whole life pretty much on tour in a band, I'm pretty sure pretty many other people mm-hmm that we work with have had similar struggles you I, know, and some yeah. it doesn't end well. I don't mean to trivialize uh, autism or anything like that, but I often have had many conversations with a lot of my friends and, and people I work with about how a lot of us artists are somewhere on the spectrum, you know, and some of our artist friends like are, are further along than, than some, yeah. some others. But Whatever that really is, there's something there. I mean, there's something about just we're all somewhere on the spectrum a little bit. Yeah, and you know, and even without that factor, there's the one of my things I've been saying lately, which is kind of sounds more glib than I probably mean it, which is if you live long enough, you see a lot of your funny, creative, quirky friends become fully blown insane. And, and <laughs> yeah. that's happened a few times. I mean, yeah. Frank Nevada from Descendants was an early example. But it is a thing. A lot of my friends that I, you know, I I met through the music scene or the various art scenes I've moved through, yeah, they were always the most crazy, creative, wacky people. But sometimes that stuff doubles down on itself. And they can end up, well, in a few cases, institutionalized. Right. <laughs> and that's a weird one. That is you know, weird. That is they weird. They don't prepare you for that, but on a long enough timeline, that stuff's kind of bound to happen. I think, I think so. I think so. There's always there's always outliers, but there's always that. Yeah. But, you know, that's the thing is, you know, we're going to go through life. The interesting people are the people that usually are that 
on that edge. <laughs> That's the thing. And they're the ones that usually make really good art. Yeah. Really good music. So there's that too. I mean, it's, it's a funny thing, but you know, uh, I also noticed, and this is a thing that I can just talk to talk from experience that it's very, because of the nature of how tour works always on the road, it was always very easy for me as far as, uh, I guess, commitment issues with, you know, various partners of mine, it was very easy to cut ties because I'm always going away. Yeah. So it forms intimacy issues that, you know, with a lot of people, I think, where it's really hard to have a sustained relationship with someone. It can become very difficult. You're used to having the getaway switch, you know. And then now you're stuck. Yeah, I'm going to bail them to Australia for two months, you know, whatever. There was a, a, a huge rate of of separations, divorce over the pandemic. It's hard. And yeah. yeah, really hard for people to be together. I mean, you know, if if you're lucky, then you strengthen your relationship during that time or just skated through and, and like held on, right? Uh, everybody's yeah. different. And I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to poo poo anybody that did get a divorce. Sometimes it's a good thing, right? Sometimes it's, you need to get away. But there is something real about the, artists on tour running looking for something whatever it is you know the famous youtube song yeah. you know it <laughs> still haven't found what i'm looking for but well, um, i used to joke i used to joke about it that you know stefan and myself uh kind of followed the pattern which is if you're raised in a place like salt lake which is a very nice place but it's very insular one of your first instincts is to get away from it yeah yeah why is that so, you know <laughs> and so we kind of followed that <laughs> So let's talk about Descendants. I would love to talk about bass playing, okay. Descendants all. Uh, my first my first time seeing you was with all. But I'd love to, I, I don't, even though I'm a huge fan, I don't necessarily know all the details. And I know our listeners don't know necessarily all the details. I'd love to know when you started playing uh, with with the Descendants and all. Okay. And what well, came first? Probably the Descendants. Descendants came first. Um Stefan and I had been part of a punk rock band in Salt Lake uh, called The Massacre Guys, and we did some tours with TSOL and quite a bit of gigging around Salt Lake. Stefan moved away to D.C. The Massacre Guys still existed in some form, but really weren't playing. And uh, I started playing with a bunch of other groups. And because we were playing, of all places, in Boise, Idaho, with this other group I had called Pravda, uh, the people we were staying with... uh, had a band <clears throat> and Bill Stevenson called asking if maybe their bass player was interested in trying out for descendants, which, you know, he was not by the way, it was a band <laughs> called state of confusion and uh, he was not interested and I was there. So I took the phone call and, you know, arranged things and then went down to LA. I rode a train down to LA, which tells you how broke ass I was at the time. Hey, better a than a bus. Yeah, man, it was pretty old school, right? I had all my clothes in a garbage bag and my base with me. And I, I, took you, the, I took the trip and I went down and, yeah. We you have a hobo together. stick? Yeah, we practiced together. And I, I got to preface this. I had known Bill a bit socially because of the many Black Flag tours and the Descendants I Don't Want to Grow Up tour. Okay. He'd already traveled through Art City and we kind of knew who they were. And What year was know, this? Uh, 1986. Okay, okay. Was when I first joined up. And the scene was pretty small, you know, everyone kind of knew each other in that scene anyway. So it was not that big of a deal. Stefan had been living in Washington, D.C. And as I told you before, he and I had been in a band together. He's always been a guitar player. We met when we were 12 and he's always been a guitar player to the point where, you know, back when we were kids, Mm -hmm. adult musicians would give him respect because he was a good enough guitar player. (laughs) Yeah. In any case... Years down the line, he had been living in D.C. I think he had moved there to try to be part of a classical music program and uh, I guess didn't make it. He heard I had joined the band and offered to come out and audition because he needed a guitar player. So then he flew out and, you know, started practicing with us. And that's where that whole Descendants All lineup comes from. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. See, yeah, Stefan had told me the story, but I I couldn't remember if it was him that got you in or you that got him in. And he didn't tell me the story about you getting the phone call from Bill. So that, that kind of like puts the pieces together. Or I didn't even get the phone call. It was yeah, technically. And I just happened to be there. You, you know, snaked the it. Yeah, but it was, it was kind of, it was fun and it was kind of odd because, you know, I, I had spent so much time 
I came up in Salt Lake City, so it's like it meant leaving a lot of uh, friends and you know musicians I had played with kind of yeah. behind, which is a little bit bittersweet. Let's talk about stylistically. Uh, the first record was was what that you played on with with Descendants. Uh, that would be Descendants All. Descendants All. Okay, so so that was um, what? How did you develop the style for your bass playing? Was it did it exist before you dis- you joined the band? A little bit, but I mean, I had only started playing bass about four years before I started playing with Descendants. Okay. And fortunately, with the help of Stefan and John Schumann, who was the other player in the Master you guys are one of them, uh, they kind of helped push me along. But I, I got to tell you, from the minute I started wanting to play bass, I played with anyone who would remotely entertain the possibility. So I ended up playing with, you know, kind of what I call like more more or less normal rock bands. I played with some very experimental groups and, you know, just kind of spread myself around some, even what we'd call today, I guess, a jam band or two. Yeah. You know, I even messed around with that and, you know, messed around in passing with reggae and all these other forms. Like I said, I played with pretty much anyone who would ask me. And I think that's the real education before Descendants. Right. But because it wasn't exclusively punk rock stuff, I think maybe that colors a little bit of what the base approach is on Descendants All. You know what I mean? Yeah. While I have a, you know, we all have that background of like, or at least in our band we do, where like, okay, we discovered this thing called punk rock through the Ramones when maybe, you know, in the 70s when we were just young teenagers. And then as time moved forward, we ended up with, you know, oh, wow, here comes Black Flag. Here comes, you know, all the hardcore bands of the early 80s. And what's, I guess, you know, all that stuff's just in the DNA. So we don't really have to work that hard at that stuff. You know, yeah. It's just kind of built into us. But the Descendants All album does experiment and reaches out wildly. And Stefan, as I said, had contemplated studying classical. So there's a little nod to that on the song Impressions. Uh, you know, it was, it was very interesting how quickly that all fell together, you know. Because I think I first met with Bill in August. And then by October, we were making the record as memory serves. Wow. You know, it's quick. It was like yeah. that kind of a thing. Everything happened so quick back in those days though, right? When you were like developing and, and starting out, it seemed like so yeah. many things were packed into like a, sh- like one year. Yeah. It's crazy to think about, right? Yeah. We were, and all, you know, we took out off on tour pretty much right off the bat too. When I joined the band, I remember that. I mean, it was kind of an unstated thing. You had to be understand that you were going to be touring a lot. Ready to tour, right? <laughs> yeah, tour ready. Because I mean, we had met all those SST bands, and the main reason we knew them at all was because those bands toured like crazy. Mm-hmm. Black Flag, the Minutemen, those guys did a lot of touring. There's some other bands, DOA, toured. They came through, could be counted on to come through once or twice a year to a podunk place like Salt Lake. You know, so of course yeah. they made an impression. So you got, back then, if you wanted to make an impression on the locals. That was the way you do it, you know? And so we toured a, a lot, a lot with that Descendants record. And then uh, when Milo went back to school, we already had the plans in place for doing a band because we'd enjoyed working together with the Descendants stuff with me and Stefan and Bill. Yeah. And the luck would have it, David Smalley was coming back from Israel where he had been going to school at the same time. So that kind of morphed into the first generation of all where once again, the focus was tour, 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 tour. And that's yeah, what yeah. we did. And then oh, many man. singers coming, went, came and went, and many records were made. And somewhere along my, the line, we met you guys. So you know. Yeah, yeah. We met in, uh, well, 97. 97 was when, when you yeah. guys were back out with Descendants. You came back. Uh, I saw you guys play before I met you, and then we met you on the on the Warp tour, and and it was great. I mean, you were up in Bremerton, right? Bremerton, so Washington. Was yeah, the Natasha shows, the famous Natasha. Shows. See that's see that what's funny about the Natasha shows in Bremerton is I was too young. I didn't even know about Natasha's until after oh. Natasha's was gone. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was the next generation. It was just a big dirty club. No worries. The yeah, I know. Were- no, you try to like play it down, but like that would have been, of course, our, our mutual buddy Mike Moen. Uh, of course. From Neutral Boy. He uh, He's still around. I just talked to him the other day, and uh, he's doing well. But he he was there. He was definitely there. But I, I missed it. I was too young. And uh, But I, was- if I could go off on, on, you know, experiences that I had with you guys with all, my first all show was at the OK Hotel in oh, okay. Seattle, Washington. And it yeah. was, you guys were headlining. It was my name and 
Uh, it was uh, somebody else kind of like that. It was uh, who's Frank? Left Frank insane. the singer. Uh, what's that? Left? No, not Left Insane. Would it have been that band? No, no. It was uh, Big Queer Drill the- Car. Big drill car. Big drill okay, car. Amazing. So so it's funny about about seeing you. I was a I was an all fan, but it was back in the days of the cassette. I had a cassette and it and it was uh it was like I think it was percolator, but it was it was like new theme comes in. So yeah, it was percolator, but I didn't know it was percolator. It was like a cassette. And uh so that's the record I had. I had some I had some descendants records like you know, good good things and and, and stuff. So I go to the show. I was a kid. I was in junior high and just getting into punk rock music and, and kind of wanting to play, you know, myself, but not really knowing what to do. So anyway, I go and I see, I want to say it's my name and I didn't know what you guys look like. And you kind they kind of sound a little bit like all. And so yeah, I was like, okay. in there. so I saw, I saw the bass player play a music man, Stingray. And I was like, that's an amazing bass. And I thought it was you. And I was like, no, okay. that was Rob Williams. No, so I know. Yeah, your instinct was not misplaced. That guy is still one of the best bass players I think we ever played with on tour. I mean, I think he lives in uh, Echo Park and does soundtrack work now. Oh, I'm that's sure. His main job. But yeah. he's in a, oh, that guy was, I had to really live up to that guy. I mean, there, there's something to be said <laughs> for putting a band on the bill that plays before you that you know is going to push you. Yeah. And Big big Drill Car were no exception either. My God, when those guys were really cooking it was really hard to take the stage after them. Yeah, you know, they're a great band. They, just, they used up all the energy in the room. You had to build it up again. Yeah. So, uh, was, so I saw them play, and I thought it was you guys, because I didn't know. I was a kid, and it was yeah. like my first real punk show. I'd, I'd been to local punk shows and stuff and bigger yeah. shows, but this was like a new experience for me. And seeing the Percolator poster on the wall going up the stairs into the venue, I, I, I kind of have this visceral memory of the show and one of the things was just oh i'm a dummy i thought that was the i thought that was all and then all of a sudden they're done and then all start setting up i see stefan with his bald head and and then you start i mean then you guys go off and and scott you know scott was uh scott reynolds was the singer and he looked just like popeye like you guys always have on the poster (laughs) shirt off cord around his his neck you know, going down his in between his body, you know, just oh, like, yeah, it, you were, yeah it, it, sorry, it, I'm almost done. No, he was out for blood back then. He was definitely. Absolutely. You know. I just was blown away. You guys blew everybody away uh, at that show. And the next day at school, there was just a couple people, a couple other punk rockers that were, they were older than me, older kids. Uh, and I kind of looked over and I just, I felt cooler that day i was like because they looked at me like i was like oh he knows <laughs> yeah no that's actually a lot of early punk rock in my high school you know the the first group of actual punk rockers i knew it was kind of the same thing where you know you'd be sizing up people who were in your classroom and then finally you'd notice oh wait that guy's got a you know a button that is a, a ramones button oh okay that guy is into into the clash yeah so you Long before the style statements started with the funny hair and the and the safety pins and all that was the thing of like, oh, these people are into this music, you know, and quite a few of them were kind of refugees from what I'm going to call like the ordinary rock music scene that was going on in 1977 or 78 or whatever it was. And they were just people who wanted the next level of that stuff. And the punk rock stuff was made for them. But that's the first community of people it was like me, Stefan, a fellow named Louis Latham a girl named Robin Oliver, like it was these, this handful of people, you could recognize them. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, here, one of the ones. Okay. Secret Club. It's so Secret cool. Club. Speaking of Secret Club, just like the idea, I'm thinking back to that show and seeing you guys, you appear from the backstage. And it's just like, there is something really mysterious, even though I know what's back there now. There's something so cool about being part of that scene, being at the show, seeing the bands come out. And, and you know, back in those days, I didn't, I didn't have any gauge of what was big and what was small. Like if you were on a stage and you were playing for people and I paid to see you, you were a professional musician. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and and you guys obviously were, you guys were amazing. So to me, it was like punk rock was, was just part of the music business. I didn't realize that it was just like this whole other thing. I mean, there's lots of things that are whole other things, but. It's kind of been, it's kind of infused in now a little bit, 
better. Yeah, you know, of course. With, like the clubs and stuff. It was kind of a very, very cult music for a lot of years. He ended up playing a lot of strange venues. But, I mean, <laughs> you know, that... That's part. That was sort of part of the appeal too. So I can't say much about that. I mean, that, putting on your own shows yeah. was always cool. Do you guys do that? Oh, yeah. Did you guys do that about? Um, we, well, the Massacre guys certainly did. My yeah. first band did a fair bit of that, and uh, but beyond that, I really we haven't done that much of that, other than like you said, bringing the bands we want to when we go out on tour with us. Yeah. You know? And over the years, that's been really fun. You know, a lot of the bands like this band called the Toadies we toured with back in the nineties. I love the Toadies. That did pretty well <laughs> in the Texas boys, right? So they did good. Yeah. I saw you guys in Seattle with, with, with Toadies and all. Yeah. I, don't know, yeah. I don't know. It was like at this weird place. Speaking of random venues, you guys probably worked with, with a, a, a new promoter or, or friends or something, but it was at a, a venue that was just kind of like the sailor hall or something. I had never heard of it, but it was so yeah, much it was fun. Yeah, weird. I remember that. You one. remember that? Like, yeah. you probably never played there again. I don't think. No, I don't, I don't believe you did. But yeah, I was there. I, I, yeah, it, it it feels good to just be part of part of the scene. You know, part of like yeah, okay. That's that's why I'm so bummed. I missed the Natasha days. Uh, oh, well. But you guys never came back to Bremerton. We had a couple other venues. We had uh, Cafe Zoo, downtown Bremerton, that yeah. Coffin Break played, and a couple other Seattle bands came out and played. And and we had some bigger venues. Uh, you know, we had bands like uh, the Gits from Seattle. I don't know if you ever remember the Gits. I remember the Gits. They were so good. Very sad history there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, very sad yeah. history. Yeah. Almost unbelievable. But Yeah. The great band, though. Great band. You know, we felt... When we yeah. fell in with those guys from my name, you know, we did so much tour with them. And then when we moved to Colorado, a lot of those guys ended up living here and forming a band called Wretch Like Me and helping us out with the owned and operated record label. Yeah. And to this day, uh, the drummer from Wretch Like Me, which was the heir to the my name thing, is still one of the best engineers at the Blasting Room, Jason Livermore. So that scene's kind of still all permitted. But they're the guys that turned me on to the Gits. And a lot of the Northwest acts, because honestly, you know, like a lot of bands that tour a lot, we didn't really know of bands unless we played with them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we, we played a gig with them. It's like, oh, Coffin Break. I recognize those guys. You know? There was a band up here called Hester Prynne or Hester Prine. Oh, yeah. You remember them? Yeah, those guys were great. Oh, my God. Yeah, the, bass would, the bass player would the bass player would pick up. Always up. Stace. Not down. Stace. Stace is a great Stace. dude. I know Stace. We used to yeah. stay at his house all the time when we were out there. BMX Stace. Stace. Yeah. And Bert was on guitar. Yes. And I'm trying to remember who the drummer was on that one. I want to say it was yeah, Sean or something, but I'm Sean. Not, yeah, was it right. Sean? Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Hester Prime and the My Name guys kind of fell into our orbit at about the same time. You yeah. know, they all were sort of in in our same world of thing. And over time, like, for example, Joe Young, who was the road manager for uh, Wretch Like Me, he turned us on to the band Zeke. Zeke, yes. They're from uh, Federal Way or something. From cassette demo stuff, and we fell in love instantly. Like that, So we toured with them ultimately, but man, what a great find. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> Stefan, uh, I think, produced and mixed one of their records and... He and Bill did Super Sound Racing. Okay, there and, you go. And it's there's a, an abundance of stories around that record <laughs> that are uh, just amazing. And then later on, still there, and this is a fun trivia, the band Wretch Like Me I had mentioned that had moved out here acquired a bass player also from the Bay Area named Jeff Matz. And he came and played with them for about three years, four years. And then Zeke picked him up as their bass player, Jeff Matz. And when he finally finished touring with Zeke, he joined a band called High on Fire, on Fire, and he got his Grammy Award last year for uh, for the one of best metal bands. No it's way! Kind of <laughs> yeah, Jeff Matz, and he's 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 actually as bass bass player to bass player. Don't mess with him. He's the he's one of the best out there. Wow! wow. He's just got a, a good enough sense of taste that if he's playing with Zeke, he's not trying to pollute it. He's got to play Zeke. Right. You know? Of course, you have it's, to be with the band. Yeah. Wow, but that's yeah, cool connection between all these bands from the northwest it's just like and we always had this is a weird one for some reason in the 80s we often found ourselves on the bill with the melvins okay and i, I think like a lot of the prevailing thought was since you know we didn't really fit in with any of the genres that were really going on at the time and the Melvins really didn't, because we're talking like 87, 88, in that zone, 89. The grunge thing hadn't hit yet. 
And they were, so they just kind of put us on the bill with them a lot. And it was always really funny because the crowds were separate and distinct for each band. The Melvins would finish playing, their audience would leave, our <laughs> audience would come in. It was really very bifurcated because the audience for the music was so separate. Everybody just but smoking still, in the parking lot waiting for you to go on. Yeah, waiting for the band. But still, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was, I'm glad that I can say I was on the bill with those guys because yeah. honestly, you know, they were, still are, one of the, my favorite bands that I've gotten to, you know, know and grow up with and grow old with. You know, I remember seeing those guys in Salt Lake City when I still lived there. You know, they've always been here. Yeah, that's how they I feel. Always be a Melvins. That's how I feel about you guys. I mean, you're you you in particular. You're a bass player's bass player. You know, you're somebody that that us bass players look up to. And and I definitely I got a lot of influence from you uh, when well, I was the learning. Trick, the, the trick of it is, it's kind of funny. I don't know if I would have developed the way I developed, except for okay, Stefan had a bad habit early on with our first band of every song he wrote was more complicated than the last song he wrote. <laughs> so it forced me into a pretty steep curve of yeah. having to figure out some things. And then having joined Descendants, and of course, obviously, the legacy that Tony Lombardo brought to the band as far as mm -hmm. being a very fast, frenetic, crazy bass player. I mean, I'm, it's pretty amazing when I look, listen back to what he was doing because it's very ambitious stuff. And you add to that, that Bill Stevenson wrote a lot of the crazy bass parts. He wrote the bass part for My Edge, for example. Okay. And so he's already behind this idea of maybe bass that isn't doing DD remote, that isn't just, you know, pounding out the eighths underneath the thing. So it sort of forced me into a more ambitious headspace than a lot of guys in punk bands end up in. Yeah. You know? It's kind of weird. And I think, you know, I think it's a net good thing. I, I, there's also an element of um, Mike Watt was in there somewhere. Yeah, I'm Minutemen. In the background of my mind, if I, nowhere else, as an example. Yeah. You know, like, he's getting away with all this crazy, I mean, seriously, he's, he's got a whole vocabulary. Portal this, right? things, and you, Just, did you take some yeah, of that from... Yeah, Chuck Dukowski's attitude, because, mm -hmm. you know, no one has a, a better bad attitude than Chuck. You know, he's a bruiser. <laughs> Uh, you know, a lot of those early SST guys, Chris from the Meat Puppets, I feel doesn't get nearly enough credit for being a crazily inventive bass player, but that's just me. Right, know? right. Well, going back to Tony Lombardo, you know, he he definitely had a style, and, and I feel like you took what he did and made it your own and, and went absolutely crazy with it, you know? So you, you took it way I next level. I was aided and abetted by Bill and Stefan at every turn, though. Sure, of there's course, always, of course. Well, there's, a moment, there's always a moment when I'm recording... And Bill's like, no, nah, we need something else there. No, nah, there needs to be something kind of there. <laughs> let's and fill so that we, up. <laughs> we, we end up backing ourselves into corners with a lot of the bass parts because it's like, oh, let's do something crazy. There. So do you? So let me ask you. So when you're when you're songwriting, when you're writing, do you, are you writing the songs and the bass parts when you're writing? Like maybe you as a songwriter, or do you do that when you're recording a little bit more? Depends on the song. Um, I tend to write on acoustic guitar. Okay. And then apply the the song the bass parts later sure that makes any sense yep though there have been a handful of songs like uh, the song coolidge for example where the the bass part was the first part i got you know it sure. depends what i'm trying to do yeah i think that, that makes sense uh, that, that's me too i write on an acoustic guitar and then i'll add bass and then if i have a specific idea then that that could be a whole song that i can write around just that bass line but then i'll i'll go back to the acoustic and flesh yeah, I mean, out the rest of the song you or know, something. Oddly enough, Milo can be fairly specific about what he wants on his songs with the bass. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the time, you know, I'm really telling his line. What is he like? Do, do, like do, 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 No, he, he will record demos <laughs> and you know, oh. have a bass card on it. Okay. And there's, yes, you know, and if he's got a cool thing, yeah, I'll do it. No problem. Mm -hmm. the, the, fun, the fun one, this last batch of recordings to me was Stefan got himself in writing very in-depth bass parts for a lot of the songs like Shameless Halo and things like that. I am right. literally playing only what he laid down. There's minimal amendment to it. I'm playing what Stefan laid down because the parts are bad, man. Yeah. So, you know, okay. so that's, that, that's developed over the past bunch of recordings. That's cool. And that's really fun because honestly, Stefan and I had a philosophy early on where we tried not to ever play the same thing as each other at the same moment. 
if that sounds weird, but you know, <laughs> you listen to some of the all stuff, it's very evident that that's what's going on. Yes. So, you know, this has been a real interesting thing. It's like, oh, so that's what the bass part's supposed to be. I'm on it. That's cool. And Bill can be specific too, but you know. So, okay, let's let's go through a couple songs. Scary Sad is one of my all-time favorite songs in general, but alt- also bass line, like amazing bass line. Uh, I don't know how you came up with it. It is insane. And I've figured it out, too. And, and it's just, like, mind-blowing. do 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 Yeah, I think Bill had some ideas in that one. I'm not... Let me think about it for a second. But, yeah, that one was pretty much just practicing a lot. And I, I don't know if you're like me, but I have sort of a weird inner thing that tells me this would be a good idea for a bass part for this part. And it's also informed by, okay, what's Bill doing on the drums? Yeah. And, you know, paying attention to, okay, that's what his, ki- you know, what his kick's doing. Okay, that's his pattern. And building apart from there, you know, because, I mean, let's face it, man, drums are where the whole thing becomes real, you know. So paying attention to right. the drummer often inspires me to come up with interesting bass parts. Because what happens if I follow this part of what he's drumming? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, Bill is a very interesting drummer, to say the least. He's oh got, gosh, uh, yeah. I let's mean, see. He, he, no one can play faster and sound smoother at it than maybe I don't know, maybe maybe Earl Hudson from Bad Brains, but like <laughs> Bill's pretty much the the king of playing fast as hell but smooth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't it doesn't sound like what he's doing, but you're like, what? Okay, that's crazy. it. Doesn't sound forced at all. Yeah, just he's just chilling. Natural, he's like <laughs> natural, crazy, fast tempo that's just cruising. It's weird. Yeah, I love it. Actually, the one I like, we bought a big drill car, car before, but um, Danny Marcroft from that band had this really cool thing that way, too, where you know he'd be trucking along, but still, you know, there was definite Van Halen feel to it, it was very party. The way yeah. his beats go, even moving at those tempos. Van Halen you know? feel. That is a good way to describe that. Yeah, big drill car stuff. And some of the some of the all stuff, like a few of the songs you guys did. Um, yeah. But those guys brought the that those guys really brought that Southern California party <laughs> band. Right? Yeah. They were really good with it. Good times. So another song. Uh, so we did Scary Sad. Uh, I want to know about Shreen. Great bass line. Um, I think that was pretty much all built. Just, the bridge like, might have been me, but that straight the straight line thing yeah. you know, that we're doing most of it. I, I think that's that's also a, a fixation we had at one time because so much of this stuff is very involved bass parts, mm-hmm. and kind of there I do enjoy playing straight line stuff and letting the song breathe a little. You know, I think and maybe that's, that's partly part, part of being a bass player. Absolutely you know? agreed. It, maybe that's partly why the song works so well is because yeah. it breathes, and you're like, oh. This is different, but it's still, you know, still yeah, you're all. To get away. There's a point to getting out of the way of the song. Yeah. You know, and, and there's an art to knowing, you know, when it is time to actually play the straight line with it. Right. You know, that's and that's its own thing. You know, that's I, I, I'm a big admirer of people like Kira from Black Flag and of all people, Michael Anthony from Van Halen for guys who understood when to shut up. Yes. Perfect <laughs> example. Wine. Perfect example. She's my ex. Uh, right. That has that Van Halen kind of vibe to it, but great I did. Line. I didn't think of Van Halen when I hear the song. I just think this no, is a fucking I, I, great when song. I said Van Halen. That's like uh, <laughs> an example, but there's other stuff in there too. Like do, 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 you know, do, do, do. Billy Idol's early solo records have a real straight line, yeah, big part like that. And you know, members of our band really like those records. Yeah. And there's you know the obvious stuff from the punk rock world that rolls that way, like Steve Soto. Mm-hmm. who is a genius in straight line bass parts, you know, he, uh, rest his heart, rest yeah. his soul. Yeah. You know, he was, he's an underrated genius. That guy, I, I listened back through the records he did when he was still pretty young. And I'm thinking, man, that's crazy that you were able to do that. Yeah. He was great. We wrote a song together and, and I've hung out with him a lot, you know, back in the day. Yeah. He was always the nicest guy. And, and, and musically. Yeah. We, we toured with, with him, uh, with, uh, Steve, Steve, uh, sit or no, Joe Sibbs band. What were they called? 22 Jacks. 22 Jacks. That's it. That's what it was. 22 Jacks. And Steve got to sing a, a police song, I believe, during the set. <laughs> yeah, he that's right. Very, yeah, yeah. They were, he was, they were yeah, great. He's got a, he had a beautiful voice. He, just a beautiful person all around. But just purely from a bass player, when I was learning how to play, mm-hmm. there were a series of influences, obviously, that were from our music scene. And Soto, I remember, wait, 
that's the guy from, you know, Agent Orange, and he's playing with the adolescents, but mm -hmm. he plays with, and I just recognized, began, began recognizing his name on everything he's on, and every time I'm like, man, he always brings something really nice to the table. Yeah, and absolutely. Then, yeah, you start seeing the threads. Yeah. So, question, do you, have you ever considered playing with a pick instead of your fingers? You know, when I was young starting out, I would try to play with a pick, and then I'd always end up dropping it and having to finish the song with my fingers anyway. And then drawn by the inspiration of like, okay, Dukowski was one. And still later there's Kira and, you know, a number of different finger playing punk rock bass players. I kind of thought, well, I'll just concentrate on that and try to get good at that. Yeah. yeah. I've tried with a pick, but I'm not very good at it. I mean, when I play guitar, obviously I use a pick and it seems like it should translate. But for me, for whatever it's worth, I think I've had too many years doing this thing. Yeah. But I'll try. You know, I keep trying to learn. It's just not a, not been a requirement so let's, far. Let's talk fingers because I used to play with my fingers. I started out playing with my fingers because, like I said, I was heavily influenced by your bass playing and, and your records. And uh, I did pretty good for a while. But I we started touring and I st I, we'd have to be like we'd be in a hot tub or a pool and I'd have my hand out of the water. You know, because yeah. of those calluses, yeah. you don't want to, you don't want to, uh, soften up yeah, your calluses no, and I'd have, a pain. yeah. So uh, let's I get blood blisters. Whenever we start practicing again, mm -hmm. I always have to like practice to a point and then let the blood blisters, blisters heal and then go back to it. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, that, that is very real. And, and when I, I started playing upright bass for a while when I was doing tumble down. Oh, that's, that's the callus builder. Oh my right God. There, it is insane. And it's so, a different part of your finger that gets it too. It's the side of your it's finger. Yeah. It's a whole different part. <laughs> yeah. So what do you do? Like, what else do you do? Like, is that a, an issue for you still at this point in your career? Or are you pretty much, you know, exactly how to, how to, to get around the, this issue with your fingers and calluses. There's, yeah. By now it's very instinctive for me because we did so many, I mean, it's like 30 years plus of doing that. So it's very instinctive, but you know, I, as I've gotten older, like many other people, I've had some tendon issues here and there. Oh, okay. And yeah. so, you know, oddly enough, they seem to mostly apply to the other hand, which is interesting to me. Like yeah. at one point I had to switch to a short scale fender Jaguar because I was getting bad tendonitis from a bunch of other stuff but it was very uncomfortable to play a full scale bass for a little while there. But now I'm back to the full scale, so life's good. Oh, but, good, I mean, good, pit, good. Pit players, I admire pit players. I mean, uh, one of my favorite tones is if you ever listen to the band The Stranglers on the Black and White album, it's one of my favorite pick driven tones that exists. You know, it's a distorted pick driven thing, mm -hmm. and it's phenomenal. The damned machine gun etiquette, the lead in to, to Melody Lee to the whole record is just an amazing, you know, thing of a really bitch and pick bass. And then you skip forward and I've got no means no on my, on my deck, you know? And yeah. it's like, man, I got to say the approach is sound. I'm just not real good at it. That makes sense. That makes sense. A lot of, you know, th there's a lot of a divide between finger players and pick players with, when it comes to bass players, you know, <laughs> ideally you're like Matt from Rancid and you can do both. Right. In an ideal world, you're that guy. Yeah, you know he's great. But I'm not that guy. I don't think you are. I, that I don't guy think I, I. I mean, I can <laughs> get it done on the on the on my fingers if I drop my pick, but it's yeah. not going to sound the same. I'm going to be a, like preoccupied. It's it really it takes it takes just getting through that. When I switched to a pick, it was um, well, really ultimately we were on this cross country tour in Canada, and I slammed my fingers in the bus door uh, of our of our bathroom door so it wasn't like the, the heavy heavy front bus door but it was the bathroom door no, nevertheless my fingers were just fucked up and, and you found and, a way and i found a way i used i taped them up and i was still using my fingers but at that after that tour i was like man this is just these fingers man i just i gave up basically well tony lombardo was a, started out as a finger guy and then uh at one point just due to the band's ever-increasing tempo switched to a pick Mm -hmm. which he's been doing ever since. And he's great. I mean, I love his, his thing. another great pit player. Not a lot of people listen to the band Saccharine Trust, I think from the punk rock community as it is right. now, but their original player, Earl Liberty had a really great pick sound and style that was, you know, really aggressive within a band that's, that's not known for being super aggressive. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's one of those ones that I remember listening to that tone and thinking it was great. Joy Division, another great pick bass band. Oh, love Joy you Division. Can't, you literally can't play a lot of those parts without having a pick, you know? Yeah. 
this is all wonderful stuff that developed when I was, you know, coming into music. And yeah, in a weird way, I wish I could play with a pick well. <laughs> yeah, I love those sounds. there's there's some people that play with their fingers on a electric guitar. Have you ever seen that? Like actually, do 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 do. Not often, not often. Not often. I mean, the people who can get away with it can get away with it, I guess. And and of course, in the wonderful world of you know country music, there's a lot of sure. finger picking that goes that's on true. with or without the thumb picks and the finger picks. But so that's its own tradition, I suppose. Yeah. You know? So do you get into other styles? I mean, I do. I know you get into jazz and stuff like that, but like how? How much do you do you feel like that influences your playing nowadays? Oh, I I think it comes into play, but I don't try to make it come into play. If you know what I mean. Yeah, you just go with. What I mean, I like, comes like out. I, I adore I adore country music, and you know I'm going to give the disclaimer. Obviously, you know contemporary pop country music or what they're calling country is very <laughs> yeah. good. But I'm saying I'm a, I've always been a fan of country music. I I love blues music. I love reggae music. I love ska music, uh, hip hop music. I love it all. You know, I just, I'm not big on genre. I find an artist and I listen to them. And sometimes there's a takeaway that maybe influences my playing. Sometimes there isn't. I don't, I'm not sure what it is, but I yeah. think the idea is I don't try to ever do anything consciously that way. You know? Yeah, of course. Like, oh, I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw a little country riff in here or whatever. It's just kind of like, I feel like Bill and me and Stefan, as a musical entity, we've been throwing musical ideas off each other for so long. I feel like we don't really have to be that conscious about it. You know, we each know, we each have our own vocabulary and like every other vocabulary in music, it changes over time, but we all know kind of what it is. And I think we do a pretty good job of the, you know, what a band's supposed to do is every player supports all the other players. And if everyone's supporting each other properly in the musical framework, then there's a lot of freedom. You yeah. know, if everyone understands that job, then the freedom part of, being, you know, artistic or creative or, in my case, a complete spaz on bass, it becomes much easier. You know, Bill's, Bill, you know, we all concentrate very hard on playing together and making it sound great as a unit. Yeah. And you guys have been touring, you know, well, obviously, up until the pandemic, you guys have been touring a ton and going all over the world and sort of you kind of had a, a renaissance in a way yeah just a good yeah. uh, just another good era i mean there's been a lot of good eras of of the descendants and all and and you yeah. guys and you're in a really good one right now i feel like so we hit a, we hit a groove and yeah. you know the we were kind of halfway to the new record because stefan and milo had a, a real surge in writing so you know way back last summer I spent some time in the studio with Bill recording the bass parts for those. And so those are already kind of in the can. Yeah. Stefan and Milo each have about, I think it's, it's probably not quite this many, but it seemed like they each had about like over 25 songs. Wow. They had that's just a lot of so songs. many songs. <laughs> it was like, you know, going into the studio and trying to, you know, invent cool stuff or, you know, try to figure out what they would want me to do. Yeah. Nowadays it's weird. It's very, uh, on one level, it's strange because the band is rarely in the same room when we make a record because of just, we all live in different states except mm -hmm. for Bill and me. Sure. And uh, so we get, you know, Stefan will record at his studio and send the files of his stuff. Milo will record stuff in his studio, send the files, and then Bill and me will be either at the blasting room or in Bill's basement trying to, you know, put it together and make, you know, and invent what we're doing and record what we're doing. But it's surprisingly easy to do because we spent so much time all crammed into the practice space and studio together. Yeah. You know, it's, it's proven to be very easy. It reminds, it reminds me a lot of like when I first started playing bass, the best part of my day was walking up the hill to my, uh, my drummer, John Schumann's house where we practiced. That was the best part of my day. Mm -hmm. And with, the now how we record i go over to bill's house and it's a lot like the same vibe like all right i get to go to bill's basement we're gonna record some stuff it's yeah fun, it's like you the know, best drink, part of your day we're yeah. gonna drink a bunch of coffee and invent stuff and it feels fun. good to walk out of that room probably going like we did something today oh we had a thing on the last <laughs> record where a, a former boss of my wife's was working as a handyman on bill's house as he was preparing to sell one of the houses he was in and so we were in the back bedroom recording bass parts all day. And uh, when we came out, this guy who was had been doing laying floors or whatever out in the front room 
came in and said, man, I never realized that you guys were that hard at doing this stuff because he had heard <laughs> us going all day, you know, multiple takes on the same song because yeah. we're pretty tireless that way. If it ain't right, we're going to keep going at it until we can get it right. You know, yeah. you know, you've worked with Bill before, so you know, it's like very, uh, he's very calm and very specific, but you don't take it personally that you're going to do very, very many takes to get it right Yes, because we'll be happy with the end result. He has something in his head that he wants to hear and he's waiting for you to do that. And then once he yeah, hears no, that, he's, all right, you're good. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's exactly. And you know, cause recording vocals with Bill is the most daunting, you know, cause he's, he's very much, you know, has the ear for like, nope, Nope. Yeah. <laughs> no. Nope. You, I, I would straight up get mad at producers sometimes just in my mind, you know, oh, going yeah, like, yeah, no, it's easy to do, what? but you realize, <laughs> you know, a lot of the time they're just trying to get a clear usable vocal and they uh -huh. might have some intelligence going on. I mean, nowadays there's all kinds of things they can do with your basic pitch, you know, post, but I kind of like the idea of trying to get it as right as possible, just out of pride. Absolutely, you know? yeah. You and know? I think that's something that you, you not everybody realizes, and they, they get into the studio, and like when I was a kid, you, you thought, oh, I'm doing this thing, and then you get into the studio, and you hear what it actually sounds like coming back off oh, tape. Oh, God, yes. No! Oh, like, <laughs> the humbler. Let's go back and practice a little bit more, and then, then go back to the studio. So, I mean, yeah. you, you've done all that work. Before. I got lucky early on because the band I was in, Stefan and John's band, the Massacre guys, those guys were pretty good musicians before the punk rock thing ever hit. Okay. So, you know, so their music, when we went into the studio, at least their end of it was held up pretty well. Right. <laughs> I think I did my first recording with that band. I'd been playing bass for about a month. So like, you know, with predictable results on the recording. And but yeah, there's the sobering reality when you get in the studio. What were you recording to? Do you remember? Uh, was it probably, tape? Uh, was it a yeah, tape, eight track? Definitely. Was it like an actual like? I think if I remember right, a local kickboxing champion had used his winnings to buy a recording studio, so it had with them like a two inch <laughs> tape, I think, perfect, or a half inch maybe. Okay. Yeah. So it was a and legit that's studio. It, that, uh, sort of. It was in the basement of his house. The guy's name was Harold. I couldn't even begin to tell you his last name. I don't remember it anymore. Oh, you know? man, that's beautiful. Yeah, but I mean, that was that was the first recording experience that wasn't like us and a few friends trying to fabricate a recording in the basement, which happened a couple few times. Of course, yeah, you got to experience that too. Yeah, yeah. So can I ask you about rigs? Um, I'm not a huge bass rig guy, but I, would, I know that people do want to know. Like, what are you playing? What do you love? What kind of amps do you like to play? I... Typically on tour, we rent backline wherever we go nowadays. Sure. And yeah. due to how inconsistent that can really be, I tend to rely on a uh, an SVT Blackface, the Ampeg SVT Blackface yeah. amp and the 810 cabinet. Though in the past few years, we have thrown another 810 cabinet on the stage which is there primarily to hide the mix desk behind which our sound engineer, Rhino Newman, sits. <laughs> um, but Looks if, cool. the, if for whatever reason one of the 810 areas blows out, then I have a whole other 810 area I can plug into. Yeah. And we typically have two SVT heads on the stage with us. you know. But that having been said, most of the time recording, Bill has shown a preference to putting the bass through an Ampeg Pro 4 amplifier. Okay, yep. And there's a bunch of other stuff involved, I'm sure, because Bill's bass mixes its I, own secret I prefer stuff. the Pro 4 as well. It's a little cleaner. It's a little more, you can control it a little more. Yeah, it's a little more controllable. That's what Bill likes about it. Yeah. Exactly. But for live, I just kind of go for the amp that is the most commonly available. Sure. That will fulfill my needs. And the thing about those SST blackface things you can dial a thing in really quickly. That's the other thing. Cause really all you're dealing with is like, you know, what is it? Five knobs up yeah. there. It's okay. not, you know, and if you know your sound on them, you can get it within pretty basic parameters, Yeah, you know, but plus the signal I've been using lately is almost entirely free of equalization of any kind. Like I run a very flat signal. I had to teach myself. I started practicing with the flat signal to hear how shitty my technique was and fix things. Oh, okay. And so through practicing that way with just totally clear, clean signal. So every 
fret noise, every poorly intoned note just kind of jumps out at you. I finally developed a bit of better technique through it. That's so interesting. Yeah I, really, yeah, I really roll just a flat thing. That's cool. You know? and so what, what kind of bass do you usually play? Over the years, I've used uh, Ibanez Roadstar 2 for the Zenith All record, and then a string of Fender basses, and then uh, I used the Ernie Ball Stingray, I think it was. And at one point, I had an Ernie Ball Manta Ray with a, a carbon graphite neck. But basically, I came to terms with a few years ago that when you're talking about the sentence, there's something very specific about the Fender bass tone. Yeah. At least from the early records and stuff like that. So I kind of leaned there. I like the Reverend P guitar product. P bass or, or jazz? Uh, P well, P bass, ideally, if it's me, I like a P bass with a J bass as well. Okay. Because as a finger player, it's nice to have something picking up the high end energy from the bridge. But flash forward where I'm at now. I, I was working a Reverend bass that was very, very nice. And, you know, Ken, who makes those basses, is a great person. But it was proving to not be ideal for recording when measured up against this Fender bass I have that's kind of a Franker Franken Fender. The okay. body is not an original Fender, but it's a P bass configuration. And over the years, this thing has proven out to be the best sounding bass for recording and live and the weird thing about this one to me is a friend of ours uh, a girl who used to sell merch for us sarah virch it was her bass and she never really learned to play it so she just kind of left it at the studio so i would use it to record this or that yeah. thing. i think american was recorded on that bass i think cool to be used recorded on that bass um www.sarah maybe yeah well <laughs> not on that song i don't think maybe. okay yeah, well, her remember. name's sarah but, but uh <clears throat> it's a great sounding bass. Sarah passed away a number of years ago. Oh, that's and too And the bass came into my, she traded it to me for a painting I had done at one point. Okay. So it's kind of a nice, <clears throat> bittersweet little thing of, you know, if this is, because she was with our band for a long time. She traveled. I remember her, yeah. Like, it's yeah. a nice love letter to her. Plus, it's the best sounding bass. And it is beat. It looks beat. I don't mind it looking beat because if it looks beat enough, no one's going to want to steal it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so, sometimes you, know, you find a bass that just doesn't sound like anything else, and it's just and you, gotta, you, gotta, you just got to stick with it. Yep. It's the mm -hmm. one, and so far this one has proven itself out to be the one. I replaced the neck a few different times. Currently, it's got a Jaguar neck on it for no real good reason, but it just is there. Um, one of these times, I'd like to actually get it set up really nicely and make it a really nice looking instrument, but I never seem to have the time or the money as the confluence. You know, yeah. Like, because I'd really like to send it to an A-list luthier and just have them, okay, here's what I want. I want to get really clean and really nice looking. But it's a beater. It looks like a beater. It's nice. We'll make it happen. I got one of the one of the bases from uh, Descendants and All that I've got. I'm kind of wanting to contribute it to that punk rock museum thing. That's You know about that thing? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I kind of want to just because it looks like it's been through a war. I mean, right. it is. It's primer gray. Uh, Ed Ehrlich from the Chemical People and me installed the second pickup quite poorly. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> very gouge gouge work. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, there's no tone knobs on it because they would just collect moisture in the old days. Yeah. So there's no volume or tone. It's just a flat face. Uh, go down the list. Just uh, the bridge looks like something that you'd find bolted onto a boat because it's so covered in corrosion. You know, and I think that's the one I want to give to them. That sounds says, good. Yeah. It tells the story. And that's that a, thing was really, during the drill car days. That was the, the go-to base back then. Okay. Okay. That was the one. Wow. That sounds like yeah. that would be a great base to, to put in. We, the, we the used room. to. We used to. And we got the idea from Black Flag because in those European clubs back when, there there's no air conditioning in Europe where there wasn't back then. So it would just be so wet in those clubs that you would lose bass signal. So back then we used to literally hardwire the cable into the bass. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And into the, and into the guitar at one point, because Black Flag did that too with Greg's guitar. So the cable and just goes back in the case with the guitar. With, but the problem <laughs> is the if the cable goes south, you're screwed. Oh my God, yeah. So yeah, we back then we, you know, we <laughs> learned through trial and failure on a lot of stuff, you know. We didn't know what we were doing very well. We had a whole back line over in Europe that we had built the enclosures for ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, in the basement or whatever. 
we were very do-it-yourself. Yeah, I remember seeing all your back line on the tours and just like it's it was cool. But but the scene and then going into your your uh, what do you, I guess your your bu- your mini bus like it was like mini yeah yeah. The uh, short bus. Short bus. Yeah, yeah. You guys had your bunk set up and everything was uh, carpentry, like wood. It was made out of wood and and yeah. Just going there's like, a lot of that oh, okay. involved. Yeah, you know, yeah. We uh, when we left Lomita, California in 1971, we literally tore down the practice space there that was ten layers of carpet on roof, floors, and ceiling, held up with beams. We tore that down and we moved that stuff from California to Missouri, where we were moving. Yeah. And that's what we constructed our practice space out of in Missouri, which was the, you know, decade old carpet, yeah. carpet from Lomita. And then when we finally left Missouri, we just left it, tore it out and left it. But, yeah, we always built our own places. Yeah, you, I think one of the reasons why you guys have done so well over the years is because you build things. You're industrious. You make things with your hands. And oh, in, Bill led the charge, you know. Yeah. I mean, he was the guy who really, we, you know, me and Stefan joined the descendants and, and we thought well bill's done black flag tours he must know how to do this <laughs> exactly you know because we watched how those tours were you know? right like he must know how to do this so we placed a lot of faith in him you know yeah hey he you know it, it turned out pretty cool i think you know as i a, think it's worked out bro yeah your uh liveage is my all-time favorite live recording from any band ever like i love that album and and it, it inspired me it still inspires me, really, you know, but, you know, just that's what, a, you know, that's a live record. That's a live record. I think that was. I, I can't, I, I don't disagree with you because honestly, of our live records, that one is really a gold standard. And I don't know, I, I'm always, I marvel at myself thinking, you know, how did I know how to play that well? How did I play that well? Because <laughs> yes. honestly, like I told you, I'd only been playing four years when I joined Descendants. I was yeah. learning as I went. Yeah. You know? Ultimate on the job training, hard work, and just holding on tight. You know, you just never yeah. let go. Oh yeah, it worked out. Well, thank you so much, man. We've we've had a good time with this. An hour went by. Yeah, really you can quick. edit it down to whatever seems salient. You know? No, I'm keeping it all. I'm keeping okay. it all. This is this is great. Keep it for the archives. Yeah, no, that's good. Anything else you want to let people know? Where can people find you online? You don't have it social media or anything, do you? I have a Facebook page. I don't really okay. push it that far. You know, I, I, I'll probably, you know, I've got a band I did for years in this town called Endless Monster. And we have a bunch of recordings I would love to make into records. We recorded quite a bit, but the problem is our drummer passed away about three years ago. Mm. And he was very much a brother to us all. Yeah. And it's a lot of us, it's been too hard emotionally to mix the records. Wow, but yeah. we're going to get to that in the next while. So you can expect an increased social media presence out of me when we start trying to make people understand what that band was about. Cool. Excellent. You know? Excellent. Well, I'll just put up links for descendants and all. And yeah, um, put up all the links for descendants and all. But the endless monster stuff, I think you'll be pretty surprised by how it is. I play guitar in that band. Oh, cool. I would love to hear you yeah. play guitar. That'd be it's awesome. Kind of, kind of, yeah. And I'm, I'm, you know, like I said, it's kind of the only thing that's gotten me close to playing with a pick is I have to use a pick on the guitar. There you so, go. You know, there you go. It's getting me there. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Yep. Thanks, thanks for, for doing it. Me. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. All right. Talk to you later. All right, Carl. Thanks. Bye.